Good morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's kind of you to squeeze us in between uh, semester break and the presidential hopefuls who will be here before long with their advanced folks and handlers and pollsters and media. It's going to be a busy time. Is the mic on? Good. Sorry. No, it is. There's a little clicker. Right, so which is forward. Moves this guy. It forward. That's forward. Good. Thanks. And you want to mic? Yeah. Good. Okay. I've got a couple of uh, connections here to El Paso. Uh, Harman Hosh, who's out there someplace, was a colleague from my first tour at NSF 10 years ago. I shouldn't say that it was that long ago. He and I look so young. Uh, and Sarah Graneski and, uh, and Tim Collins, Harman, are uh, out here someplace. They've come as uh, assistant professors. They were um, graduate students of ours at ASU. I am one of those IPAs, so while I look dress and talk like a federal official, I am really nothing but a professor from Arizona State University who is masquerading as a bureaucrat. Um, there's a reason I get to do this now, which is uh, 10 years ago I was a program officer. And uh, before I became a division director, I counted up that I have handled 1,000 proposals in some capacity or other as a program officer, a panelist, a reviewer. Of course, I've had grants. I've had grants declined. I've had research grants and training grants. So I've seen just about every aspect of the merit review process. In fact, I even wrote a book about it with Daryl Chubin uh, 17 years ago. So that's why I get nominated to do this. And I've got uh, a pretty ambitious agenda of what I'm going to try to cover today. Um, first part will be about NSF and about me. Um, you've just heard the part about me that matters, I think. Uh, then I want to talk a little briefly about the mechanics of the proposal process. So you just understand the general shape of it. Because that sets the stage for talking more detail about the review process. Uh, being an academic, I need to put in a scholarly interlude. So we're going to take a detour through a discussion of the latent and manifest purposes of merit review and the underlying values of it. So you understand in, in much greater detail what this system is about. And then I'm going to give you um, a walk through the preparation of a proposal and some unsolicited advice, which is worth every penny you're going to pay for it, um, which is nothing. But see, see what help it might provide you. Um, this is a little different order than the slides in your handout. I imagine these slides will be made available on uh, a website. So don't panic if it looks like I'm out of order. It'll be OK. And the same substance is going to be covered. OK, so the first secret you need to know is the National Science Foundation is not a foundation. It's a government agency. Right? So foundations have these big endowments that they draw. Either they draw down or they draw the, the profit from and spend. We don't have that. We go every year to Congress and ask for money, and we're given uh, an appropriation. This was established in 1950, as uh, George explained. Um, not a great secret that NSF and I are of about the same vintage. Um, it's an independent agency, which means it sits outside the cabinet. When the president's cabinet meets in the Roosevelt Room there across the hall from the Oval Office, there isn't a seat for the National Science Foundation. In contrast, the National Institutes of Health is represented by the Secretary for Health and Human Services. That is part of a department. NSF is not part of a department. That's what's independent about it. It doesn't mean we get to go freewheeling. It simply means we're not represented in the cabinet. Uh, guided by the National Science Board, which is appointed by the president, um, a key point, merit review is a part of the culture of the National Science Foundation from its beginning. When Alan Waterman came over from the Office of Naval Research to be the first director of the National Science Foundation, he brought with him the notion that NSF would use merit review, peer review it was called at the time, to make its decisions. His view was this would make life easier for the program officers by augmenting their judgment with a little advice from some people they would select to take a look at what was being proposed and guide them. So it was intended to strengthen program officers who were independent experts. Um, I mentioned COVs because you may be asking the question of who reviews the reviewers. And there's an answer to that. It's a committee of visitors. These are brought into NSF every three years to review programs. Um, they're um, professors, uh, folks from the outside community brought in, some from big schools, some from small schools, some who've had grants, some who've not, some who've been declined, some who've not 
We bring a group in who are experts in a field, and we open our books to them every three years. They see all the awards and all the declines and all the justifications for the awards and declines for a program. And they're given a template of questions to ask. Basically, two questions. Is the process fair? Is the process effective? In the first instance, are we following the rules? Are the decisions well justified by the reviews and by the program officer's recommendations? And secondly, given that we're fair, are we effective? Are we funding good science that's producing good stuff? Uh, these are a product of the sunshine laws of the mid-1970s. We won't relive those years, but suffice to say that um, bringing a little light into the process of government was a priority those years. And so committees of visitors come to be sure that we're, we're doing what we claim we're doing, and they write reports that are read by the top of the foundation. Two other key points. The National Science Foundation is a permeable organization. It brings rotators in. It brings reviewers in. So it is not a fortress. And uh, a lot of what we do you might characterize as uh, translation and transduction. Hold on. OK, so this is the organization chart of NSF. I rearranged it a little bit for my purposes. All these big yellow boxes basically look like a university. Right? You, you could easily make those uh, deanships and put inside departments and such. And in fact, you could do something similar for some of those things on the right there, say cyber infrastructure and polar programs. Those operate research. But other parts of this organization that sits across the border between academe and government connect to the government. So we've got a board and a director appointed by the president, an office of the inspector general that is independently funded and reports outside the agency. You see it reports to the science board, which oversees us. It does not report to the director. And of course, we've got the uh, armamentarium of a, uh, of a bureaucracy. We've got the stuff that makes awards, BFA, and we've got the stuff that handles information, including Fastlane. So part of our organization looks a lot like a university, and part of it looks a lot like a uh, bureaucracy, a federal bureaucracy. It's in that sense sort of a chimera. And much of what we do, because we sit across this border, is translation. In other words, we take what the research community seems to be interested in and translate it into budget priorities that are reflected in our budget documents. And we write these golden little phrases. This is part of my job as a division director. I get to write these little tiny sentences and paragraphs that have uh, like a million dollars attached to them that are intended to capture what looks like an emerging good idea that we're trying to get support for from Congress. Similarly, we try to translate for the research community the national priorities that are set by the President and by Congress. So it's an interface organization. And that's some of what goes on not only in these outreach days, but also in panels, where we communicate to our panels and our committees of visitors something about you know, the trajectory that we're on. Transduction. Now, some of you, I'm sure, are either physics professors or paid attention in high school physics. So transduction is the conversion of one form of energy into another. Telephones do this, for example, by taking acoustic impulses and turning them into electricity and then back the other way. So a certain amount of what we do is transduction across this, this border, permeable border between academe and government, which is we take the ideas and energy of faculty and convert them into resources that allow you to accomplish those things. And similarly, we take research findings and convert them into things that are then of interest to the policy process, the decision process, and to societal betterment. Okay, so we're really converting forms of energy and translating priorities and ideas across the border. This is the machinery that we use to do it. Uh, we will see this slide several times. You don't need to convert, convert it uh, to memory at this point. We start 90 days before the decision process when we'll announce an opportunity. And that generates proposals. We call that a proposal generating document. Combined with your ideas in the community, bring research into the National Science Foundation where it's prepared and distributed, um, reviewed, recommended, and eventually turns into an award or decline. This is the process that we're going to sketch and then examine in greater detail. How do proposals get in? Uh, I recommend through Fastlane. Those are the folks who can submit. I'll explain a little bit in a minute about the varieties of funding opportunities and the types of proposals and such. 
Uh, proposal description, sometimes called a, a uh, program announcement, is a general description of programs. These tend to be standing programs that will take proposals every year or twice a year. Uh, dear colleague letter, typically it doesn't have additional funds attached, but it calls attention to a particular opportunity. It might say that we're interested in more research on complexity, for example. Uh, a program solicitation describes a specific opportunity that is probably not a standing program or may not be, become a standing program. For example, um, cyber-enabled discovery and innovation is announced with a solicitation, as is the science of science and innovation policy. Three broad ways that you'll find out about funding opportunities at NSF. How do you respond? with letters of intent and preliminary proposals only if we ask for them. Otherwise, you can make informal inquiries of program officers. Um, to take an example, the cyber enabled discovery um, solicitation asked for both a letter of intent and a preliminary proposal. We use these to shape the review process. We have some idea of what to expect, how much of what sort, what are we going to need to do to set up a review. We also use it to try to keep the proposal load manageable by screening pre-proposals. Typically, the standing programs ask you to send in a full proposal with none of the preliminaries. You're welcome to ask program officers in advance whatever questions you have, but you don't need to send anything formal in. We have a variety of names for our deadlines and dates. Um, target dates are dates that we ask you to aim for. Typically, it's OK to miss it by a little bit. You can't miss it by a lot. If you're going to miss it at all, it's best to let the program officer know. It's possible that if you miss it by enough days that you will not make the current panel, but it will be held over for a later panel. A deadline is a deadline. Um, it's hardwired in um, if you're late. I heard discussions that folks were late even by seconds. And uh, when the door closes, it closes. Computers are merciless. Um, we have submission windows where there's a flexible amount of time in which you can send your proposals. And certain things, small grants for exploratory research, conference proposals, supplement requests, will take at any time. We may not fund them at any time. We may end up holding them for a certain period in the funding cycle. But you can talk with your program officer about those and send the proposal in whenever convenient. Some words of caution. Don't wait. Don't be late. Don't count on time extensions. Be sure you know what you're sending in and where well ahead of time, faculty in the room, talk with your sponsored project office early and often. They need weeks of lead time, typically, to get things together for a proposal submission. And afterward, keep an eye on the receipt from Fastlane. Don't count on being able to fix last minute repairs, but don't abandon hope if it turns out the next to best version of the budget justification happened to creep in. We can sometimes accommodate a replacement of chunks of text. Okay. So now you have some sense of the mechanics, how things find their way into NSF and so forth. Now we can get to something with a little more substance to it. We'll talk a little about the review process. Three phases to it. The first phase is, is uh, administrative review, where we check to be sure that it looks like a proposal and addresses all the things that we absolutely require. The second and most substantial is merit review, which is handled in a variety of ways that I'm going to describe in some detail. And effectively, it's a version of review. The decision by the program officer takes into account everything that is preceded and produces a narrative justification for the recommendation of awarding or declining a particular proposal. It doesn't sum up the scores and look at the average. It doesn't go down the list and draw a pay line. But rather, each proposal is given um, a reason for its fate. I won't walk through all of these. You've got this in your handout. But we look very carefully to be sure that the proposal conforms to the requirements. Now, I've had pretty close to th actually a little more than 30 years experience with the grants process at NSF. And I remember in the uh, early days of the mid-'70s, um, proposals would come in with uh, a book manuscript attached as an appendix. You know, <laughs> Please consider my proposal. See my attached uh, you know, forthcoming book from University of Chicago Press. That's not allowed anymore. Proposals would come in with sections in eight-point type. You know, you could barely see it. That doesn't happen anymore. If you were getting a little close to the page limit, you would 
you know, run the margins out to a quarter inch all around. That doesn't happen anymore. Again, computers are merciless. So all those things are caught in administrative review. And if you slip through, well, good luck to you. But typically, they're caught and stuff bounces back. So please be careful of these. Merit review. We really try to invest in the best ideas from capable people. And the way we figure out if that's so is by using the merit review process. It is virtually an article of faith at NSF. Two criteria. The first one is intellectual merit, which has several facets. The second are the broader impacts, which again have several facets. Every proposal doesn't need to address every facet in equal detail. Some may be stronger in some than others. The two criteria are weighted in different proportions in different competitions. Um, black letters in the first line, transformative potential is a new criterion added recently um, by instruction to the National Science Board. Folks are wondering, what does it mean? What NSF is trying to do now is tilt the balance in the review process a little more toward funding big ideas that will change the way we think about a phenomenon in fundamental ways. Some people think of this in shorthand as, as paradigm changes or as uh, contrarian research that fundamentally uh, rethinks an area of scholarship. Um, this has always, I think, been implicit in what we mean by creativity and originality, which are criteria that have stood for some time. But by calling it out by name, we are placing somewhat greater emphasis on it and asking proposers to think along those lines as well. Similarly, people sometimes wonder what we mean by broader impacts. Again, they may look different in different proposals. You want to put your emphasis in describing your broader impacts where your strength is. Some, for example, may produce a lot of educational material, a special collection, a web page. So others may involve underrepresented groups or minority serving institutions more strongly and lead to degrees for folks from those places. So emphasize that. Others still may lead to direct societal benefits that will improve our well-being. If that's the story for your proposal, tell it. Okay, You don't have to address every single one of these, but you want to address most loudly and clearly the ones that are most pertinent. Okay, Here comes the scholarly interlude, which is based on uh, some of the work I've done on merit review and is intended to give you a broader frame for understanding it. So you can see it I'm sort of the way I try to see it, which is as an organic process rather than a mechanical one. So I'll say a little bit about the context of merit review, then I will provide what is called in the trade of social science and institutional analysis, which goes back to Robert Burton and some others, where we ask, you know, what are the overt, the manifest functions, purposes that this serves, and then what are the latent ones, the things that are kind of in the subtext? Try to bring those up to the surface so we can see them and understand more clearly what it's about. And then, uh, relatedly, what values or principles guide it? There's a set of underlying principles for most social activities. Merit review is no different. What I want you to understand about merit review when we get to this slide or two toward the end is that it's being asked to serve a diversity of purposes and a set of values that are not entirely consistent with one another. And very often it's criticized because it's too much in one or the other side of the value spectrum for some people's taste. So once we've done that, I think we'll be in a position to talk better about what a proposal is, how to write an effective one, and that's you know, where we're going to conclude the talk. OK, now the best way to begin is to think about the alternatives to merit review. Because remember, this was a choice made at the birth of the National Science Foundation. There are three other ways, at least, that funds could be allocated. One is just legislate. You can take the pot of money that we'd like to spend on science, divide by 535 the number of folks in Congress, and let it go from there. Or you can divide by states or by states according to the population. This has a number of, it, it sometimes is called earmarking or more pejoratively pork barreling, but it has a number of merits. It's democratic because it follows our democratic principles of letting our elected officials make decisions for our society. From that it draws legitimacy. Democracy is a core value of the United States. And it will ensure a certain degree of distributional fairness. For example, if you distribute it by representative or by population, you'll put the money where the people are. But it has a certain number of drawbacks. 
it will be, again, a part of the political process, meaning that those will be folks in one or another political party or with some other interests who will be asked to spend the money. They may not be expert. Um, last count, there probably weren't more than a dozen or so um, scientists in Congress and probably just a handful of doctoral scientists. So they're probably not aware of what the cutting edge of research is in a field. Um, and it could be culturally corrosive because the culture of science is a culture of excellence, of merit, of competition, of uh, analytic examination. And this mode of allocating would run uh, counter to that culture. So while it's plausible, it might have some drawbacks. But understand that it's an alternative to merit review. Secondly, you could go with a strong manager system, which is to say, George, here's your portfolio. We want you to develop research in this area. Here is your budget. There is your community. Do it. Make it happen. Find stuff that will advance our aims here. Support it. Be sure it delivers. Get the goods and hurry up. It'll certainly be flexible and responsive. We can change the priorities year to year. I, I put zeros next to the following because they're sort of neutral. They're not, new, not good or bad, but different. It assumes that we've got clear standards, and I know what to ask George to go do. Right? I need better night vision stuff that goes to a greater distance, or I need certain kinds of sensors, or I need a certain vaccine. It requires outcome accountability um, for the program officer, for George, and for the grantees. You said you were going to do this. I'll be back in three months. Let's see how you're progressing. If you're not, you know, we need to talk about it. So it may not work for every purpose in every field. Sometimes you know what you want to figure out and how to go about it, in which case this kind of a mission orientation would work. Sometimes you may not be sure what you want to go about, in which case you may need another funding mechanism. Projects can have defined objectives, but a program such as the programs that NSF and NIH support, is really intended to sustain a field of inquiry and allow the front edge of the field of inquiry to figure out what the next best thing to do is, rather than to say, here are our priorities, and we will tell you what the next best thing to do is. And another down, uh, downside to this approach would be some things will fail. You're going to have to ferret out failure as soon as you can, cut your losses, and redirect your budget. You can't give someone a grant and say, you've got three or four years. You know, let's do something really exciting. You want to have accountability in a pretty short term so that you don't spend money fruitlessly. But still, an alternative to merit review. One final option. You can write a formula. There's a formula. I don't know what it means. Um, but you can say, we will allocate money to institutions according to number of scientists, number of scientists with certain citation records, number of students, number of graduate students, number of, you know, just your, the, your imagination is your limit here. Take anything you like, put it into the formula, put whatever weights you like on it, just be sure you put dollars on the left side. And then you can say, we will apply this formula and then allocate the money. Um, it looks objective, which would be a strength, but then, of course, there's the politics of who writes the formula. If you wanted to do it by student body, I'd be at the top of the list. I'm a professor at ASU. We got 60,000. So you know, I'd rather that than you know, these small schools like Princeton getting overfunded. Um, other folks might differ. You know, they might trot out their Nobel laureates and say each of these is worth you know, so many of the other. So of course, there'll be a politics to that. And, and to whom do you give the money? To the state and then have the governor allocate it? Or to the universities and let the presidents allocate it? Or departments or institutions or where? And then what do you do with it? So suppose you tell a department chair, here's your research budget. How does that person go about allocating it? So merit review may creep in anyway. Um, you wonder also whether this mechanism will encourage creativity and responsiveness. How do you, you know, be sure that the system is going to be lively rather than just take its entitlement and do its thing? How are you going to start young careers with this? You might end up giving all the money to the old folks, like me who've got you know, long vitas and accomplishments, and you'd stifle the young people like Sarah and Tim. Um, and of course, there's the possibility of gaming, which is once I find out what the elements of the formula are, I'm going to do the best I can to maximize those. Right? In which case, the system becomes a system about doing the things the formula wants. We have citation circles, for example. I'll cite you if you'll cite me, and we can both have lots of citations. 
or you know, citation impact factors for journals. The best thing on earth you can do is found a journal that has really short articles with really long bibliographies that you publish very quickly. Then you can get a lot of citations to stuff in your field you know, in short order. So understand that merit review is, review is a choice. There's alternatives. We made the choice at birth at NSF. It informs and guides program officers. That's key. Our program officers are active scientific decision makers. Um, we train them to do this. I tell my program officers this when I interview them for the job. I tell them this their first day on the job, and I remind them as they work there. The old guys don't need to be reminded, the, the permanent staff. The rotators, I remind. I say, you know, are you making your decisions? You're not to enact the panel's will. You're not to follow the reviews and rank order. I want you to make decisions that match your vision of where this field should be moving. You're responsible for your field. You support the stuff that you should be going into. You have to find a way to move away from the stuff that you've decided is played out. And it's your call. Get the advice you need and manage your funds. For that reason and others, some of the purposes of the merit review process are subtle and are often missed. It's certainly a process for what a guy named Kies Le Per, he's a Dutch uh, science policy official, calls grading the grain. Bring the proposals in, tell us what's good and bad. So, you know, let's sort the wheat from the chaff and let's figure out which wheat is better than which wheat. But it's a lot more than that. It's a source of expert advice. It advises the program officer, but it also advises the proposer. If you write a proposal to NSF, you will get back verbatim reviews, which may not agree with one another, but some of them go at some length. I've seen some that go three or four single space pages. I've written some that go three or four single space pages. They provide detailed technical advice to the person who wrote the proposal. You can take it or leave it. Some is good, some is not so good. But you get some advice from people who are knowledgeable. Um, taken in the aggregate, this is shaping the field. It also shapes the, pro, uh, the program, which in turn shapes the field. So for example, a program officer will ask explicitly, uh, let me take the social sciences, are we doing enough qualitative research? Are we funding too much work that works with large national data sets and highly quantitative uh, analytic tools? Should we doing, be doing more stuff that's qualitative? And if the panel says yes, the program officer should reproportion activity and communicate that, and it should be reflected in what's encouraged in the proposals, including, for example, taking a highly quantitative proposal and saying, can you add a qualitative element here that will enrich it? My clicker working. It's a flywheel. One of the brightest ideas in science studies is this one in the middle. Thomas Kuhn first proposed it before he wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He wrote a little essay titled The Essential Tension which is the tension between tradition and originality in science. And all of science is caught in this tension. On the one hand, new results build upon the theories, the methods, the concepts, the findings of what preceded. On the other hand, all science strives for originality, and it tries to do both simultaneously. And of course, then, when you read the structure of scientific revolutions, you're reading how Kuhn saw this tension playing out, which is that you had this punctuated equilibrium model of a paradigm that shaped things and guided research for a time until anomalies built up that it couldn't account for, and then a change occurred. But what merit review does, in part, is lend certain, uh, a certain amount of inertia or stability to a field. It makes that connection between what we know and what's claimed to be original in the proposal, and it effectively tests those claims for originality. Are these really new? Has this been done before? Is this plausible? Contrast that to some sort of fun. fun uh, funding formula mechanism, where you've got the money and this isn't working out, but you've got to deliver. You might bounce offline and bounce offline and bounce offline looking for the quick publication, the low-hanging fruit, rather than stay on course to a very good, challenging research objective that's just really hard to get to. Merit review, the specific support that you get in the textual reviews and ratings, can help an investigator stay the course when other mechanisms might, uh, might not do so. But again, this is a latent function of merit review that's easy to miss if you think it's only about grading the grain. 
It's a mode of scholarly communication in a couple different ways. When you look at how it actually works, ideas are proposed a couple of years before they start to show up at uh, scholarly meetings and three or four years before they start to show up in manuscripts that go to journals. In effect, influentials in the field, and if you yourself volunteer as a reviewer or a panelist, you'll be among those influentials, get to see and vet the ideas. They become aware of where the front of the leading edge of the field stands. That clears the way for the acceptance of these ideas because they've been heard before or this general theme has been heard before through the review process. Simultaneously, the communication often works in the other way. You'll have a person on a panel who will learn of someone's research and say, you know, I'm going to organize a session at a professional meeting on that. I guess I should invite her. I didn't realize she was interested in this, but now I see that actually if you approach this problem that's interested me from that perspective, it's, it's a richer approach. And I didn't know about this, but now I do. Similarly for you know, these other kinds of things that academics do all the time, organize meetings and workshops or special issues or edited volumes. So that the communication is working here above, uh, you know, beyond the envelope of the front edge of research. The research has been proposed, not even begun, or hardly begun, certainly not done, yet it can shape these other intellectual activities. So I think it can speed the innovation rate in a field of science. It's an enactment of professional authority. It's a way of saying science is a profession separate from other endeavors. There's lots of other allocation decisions we make where we do not use merit review. By having scientists make the allocation recommendations and evaluations, we're setting this enterprise apart from other enterprises. There's a lively debate in the fields of science studies and science policy about the degree to which that's a sensible thing to do. But merit review does it. It also creates a preserve where other considerations will not enter into the decision. I suppose I can say this on the record. Every so often we get a letter from a member of Congress that says, you know, so-and-so sent a proposal in and either, you know, it's coming or it's in, or it might say, and it was declined, and, and why was that? These things get bright red flags from the very top of the foundation. Uh, folks in George's office, when they see a letter that's got the congressional frank on it, that you know, has the return address of Capitol Hill, they open it. And they look at it. I, it was an interesting experience. Of course, I, my first time at NSF, I went there from uh, being a faculty person where I was accustomed to uh, my mail's my own. It would come opened with the envelope stapled, and it would be stamped with you know, what it needed. Um, in, in one case, I gave a, a book to a member of Congress who invited me to lunch. He's the only historian of science in Congress. Um, and so I gave him a, a book I had on the shelf. And so he thanked me for it. So it came to me, no response necessary. I mean, I, I could have said, oh, you're welcome, but. Um, but when it's an inquiry about a grant, we are given a very strict template. And we will respond and within a certain number of weeks saying, you know, this is what's happened. But that never enters the review process. It stopped at my level, division director level. We don't ever go into a panel and say, and by the way, what you need to know is that John McCain is really interested in this proposal. So bear that in mind. That never enters the room. It's a preserve separated from that. We catch that sort of interest at other levels. So it's, this is important because you see it keeps this process um, lively. That said, merit review is a place where social considerations may enter. This is formalized in the broader impacts criterion that NSF and NIH share in different ways. It's um, captured as well by program officers being the decision makers, where one of their explicit criteria is to think about a balanced portfolio. In other words, um, think not only about whether you're supporting the right subject matter for your field, but the right people, the right regions, the right sorts of institutions. And if you want to make an argument to make this award to this person at this institution because that's a minority serving institution, that's an undergraduate institution, some other reason. We say it's meritorious science, but other things equal. I see further benefits in making this award to this school that's not had one. That's a fair argument. It's a fair argument for a program officer to make. Say I'm doing this because 
when I consider other benefits of research investments, those direct me to make this award for this project that in other ways also meets you know, um, scientific standard. At the National uh, Institutes of Health, these things are called specials, where they're funded um, out of priority order. I think through this mechanism, it's possible to contemplate greater citizen participation in science. I won't go there, but this is something that's being talked about, again, at kind of the leading edge of science studies and science policy. How do we manage a better engagement of scientific and technical folks with uh, the citizenry? There's stuff to learn on both sides. It's a way to improve uh, the responsiveness of science and a way also to improve citizen understanding of science and engineering. And there are experiments in this regard in uh, some European countries that bring laypersons into the decision process formally as members of panels. OK, so that was my set of manifest and latent functions. And you've got them in your handout, so you can review them. I won't do that here. I want to talk just a little bit about the competing values that we ask merit review to serve. This will be fairly brief. Um, if you go back to your sociology 101, social values are the standards by which we judge if something is good, um, beautiful, true, and some other things. So the values are the standards, the criteria that we use. They may be unitary, um, such as you know, honor older folks, period. The grayer the beard, the more honor. <coughs> um, but in other cases, they may, there may be a certain amount of what Robert Merton called sociological ambivalence, two values that seem to have roughly equal weight in a decision. Too often, I think, when people criticize merit review, they're not thinking about the competing values that this complex is being asked to serve. Now, here's several. I won't go through every single one of them. But take a look at, like, number two here, effectiveness and efficiency. We ask the merit review process simultaneously to identify the best science that is very original, transformative, creative, at the same time to do this cheaply. We don't pay reviewers. They get their expenses covered in a, in a very slight honorarium. I can't even remember what it amounts to these days. But your point of comparison would be, um, I hope I don't um, insult anyone with this, but if you look at a, a proposal, 15 pages, pretty tightly argued of you know, cutting edge material, and a panelist would see you know, maybe 20 of these that we'd ask the person to write reviews of. And we ask them to do that pretty much for free. They get paid for their, their uh, time in DC. Compare what you would have to pay a lawyer to go through the same amount. So, and also in the aggregate, NSF spends 95% of its budget on research and 5% on figuring out what research to support. So, we're asked to be very effective, but also to do it without costing a whole lot in the process. We could pay lawyers' rates and say, again, I shouldn't diss that profession too much, but suppose we said to reviewers, we will pay you $500 a proposal to read this really carefully and write us an extensive critique. Um, it would be less efficient. We'd be spending more money. Um, we'd probably get much more detailed critiques than we get for free. Oh, we ask the system simultaneously to be sensitive and selective. Uh, these are terms that come from engineering. A sensitive measure is one that detects whatever the signal is. A uh, selective measure you know, excludes, uh, effectively excludes noise. One way to compare this is to think that a sensitive evaluation of a proposal would detect whatever originality happens to be in it, however, how, however hard to find. A selective measure would exclude anything that's silly however slight the silliness. Um, so now, translate these. Imagine that you're trying to be sure you're supporting transformative research, but you're not going to get yourself any Golden Fleece Awards from you know, the second coming of William Proxmire, who tries to hold up to ridicule anything that's uh, slightly out of the ordinary. Um, one of the famous Golden Fleece uh, Awards back in the day, this would have been in the early to mid-70s, was uh, work done by Zick Rubin, a uh, social psychologist on the difference between liking and loving. And what he found out was that if <clears throat> you had a couple together in a room, mutual focus, looking into one another's eyes for an extended period, was an indication of <clears throat> loving rather than a mere liking relationship. You'll, you'll find this in almost all the social psychology textbooks now. It's a landmark study, not at all worth a golden fleece. 
But if you want to be sensitive to any element of originality, you may have to you know, reduce your selectivity a little bit and accept the fact that you may be supporting some stuff that's a little outlandish. If you want to be certain that absolutely nothing you support is in the least outlandish or controversial, then the chances are you're going to leave some good stuff on the cutting room floor. You can't help yourself. These are competing values. Um, many others of these are similar. So the, the key thing to remember is this is a complicated system, mirror review. It's not just about grading the grain and that it's being asked to honor a variety of values that are not always in harmony with one another and to do so at the same time. So what does this all mean for uh, what I've come to think of as the contraption, which is this mechanism we use that takes our interests and your great ideas, grinds through them, and generates awards and declines at the end um, along that timeline? Back to our friends, the merit review criteria, and what happens in the middle of the contraption. We pick reviewers. No mystery how we find them, although um, folks outside the system often think it's a black box. Where did they come up with these characters? Well, um, at any point today, go to any of the NSF folks around here and give them your business card and say you're interested in reviewing, or write that on a scrap of paper. In fact, we will even provide the scraps of paper. Just give us your email address and some indication of what you'd like to review in, and you will be part of the mechanism. You can be right at the heart of the contraption. Um, sometimes we get reviewers suggested by the PIs. You're perfectly entitled to do this. The program officer knows the area and decides who'd be good. We look at the references in a proposal to see which ideas and people were most central to the stuff being proposed, and we ask some of them to review. We keep catalogs of recent meetings, you know, the, the talks given at professional associations, and we say, well, you know, this is like that. Maybe this person would be a good reviewer. We ask reviewers to you know, recommend other reviewers. We look in journals, and, of course, we go to the web and Google to try to find reviewers. It's not a secret. And, of course, we go trolling at uh, NSF days. When panels meet, we ask panelists to write reviews as well so that There'll be outside reviews as well as panel reviews. The panel looks at the outside reviews. They even know who wrote the outside reviews. In effect, they review the reviewers and review the reviews. And sometimes they will say, this is OK. This argument, I think, is actually not sound in a review. And that'll influence the program officer. Uh, the key things are their institutional conflicts. Uh, for example, if uh, I've recently received an honorarium from, from UTEP, I can't. Uh, review your proposals. It will look a little bit like a, I'm thanking you for your honorarium by awarding you something. Uh, if I'm a candidate for a job at a university, I can't review their proposals as long as I'm an active candidate. Um, certain personal relationships exclude reviewers. If you've been a co-author within a period of time, I think it's four years, you shouldn't be a reviewer of one another's proposals. Mentors, dissertation advisors, and advisees have lifelong conflicts with one another. We assume that's such a close relationship that neither the mentor nor the student should review one another's work ever. And so you're supposed to just remove yourself. Program officers are active decision makers. We ask them to read the reviews and respond to the substance of the review, not the rating alone. So that we sometimes get people who've been declined who will write to us and say, but I got three excellents. But an excellent that says, this is a timely idea that's really well explained, and I think this is just a crack PI, isn't really helpful. That's an endorsement. That's not a very penetrating review. So if that's what we got for a review and an excellent, that's not going to have much weight compared to one that goes through and says, this idea is important because, this method will work because, and maybe it then says it could be better if this investigator is accomplished in these ways. Okay? It's, it's much like what makes for a good letter of recommendation for a student. Right? If you write a letter of recommendation for a student that says, this guy is just wonderful, really great, top notch, first rate, um, please write if you have any more questions. You know, that just isn't very helpful. 
So there could be a lot of these very, you know, these gossamer reviews and a couple of really trenchant reviews that rate something just good. And you know, the, the trenchant ones will, have the, will win the day. The program officer also looks for fairness. If we get a, a re review that's foaming at the mouth, and in fact, I had one uh, when I was a program officer, we, have a, uh, we, we treat these with a stapler, which is that you fold it over and you put a staple through it and you say, not considered. And we leave it in the jacket. So when the committee of visitors comes later, right, because these things are all like electronically visible, they will see this foaming review and you'll say, yeah, but you see, not considered. Um, so those aren't helpful either. But the program officer checks to be sure that this review is, is fair. It's not ad hominem. We're looking for the reasons. And of course, the key thing is that this is an organic process. I don't know how many of you have had review, panel review experience with NSF and with NIH. I have done both. The NSF process, in my view, is more organic. At NSF, what happens is the program officer actually uses the panel as an instrument of evaluation, sometimes asking questions, provocative leading questions, such as people will be moving toward a, a recommendation to fund a proposal, and a good program officer will say, well, what do you, what do you make of you know, the, the Blatt's review here that says that really there's not much, much new in this? And you get the panel to go on record with an explanation for why, indeed, the Blatt's criticism should be set aside and why this is, in fact, imaginative work. So the program officer is an active uh, interlocutor of the panel, not a passive recipient of its wisdom. The NIH system is, is different. Panels are run by folks whose job it is to run panels. And the decision makers for the programs generally do not speak. They, they watch the panel. They don't run the review process. They don't interrogate the panel. And that's very important because so you could get a proposal with five E's and, and a panelist who's got reservations. You want to draw that panelist out and either understand that those reservations don't hold or understand that they're very sound because it's the program officer who writes a textual recommendation who is responsible for making the call. It is no defense to say the average rating of this proposal was 3.67, so I must fund it. That argument holds no water. Maybe I've said too much about that, but I just want you to understand the difference. It's a process of discussion. So we asked the program officers to take all these things into account, including its potential transformative impact, which places a heavy burden on the program officer. There's not a lot of room for cover. But it's also what makes these jobs interesting and why you should consider them. You should consider you know, taking a tour as a program officer. You will not be asked to average the reviews and fund the top part. You'll not be asked to enact the will of the panel. You'll be asked to do what's best to lead your field where you think it should go, taking into account the best advice you can get on that. So we ask you to think about all this stuff in making the best investments for your field as a program officer, which, of course, is why a proposal may get three excellence, two very goods, and no funding. Because the program officer has to take into account a complex set of requirements. In fact, I was part of a proposal in one interdisciplinary competition that got uniform excellence, five excellence, and no money. Twice. Comes with the territory. OK, so given all that, you know the contraption, you know now the theory, the philosophy, if you will, of of merit review. In just a few minutes, I want to walk you through the proposal writing process and give you some advice to the extent that you care to listen to it. Um, again, it's worth just every penny you're paying for it and not a penny more. Um, so a good proposal is a good idea well expressed with a clear indication of you can read that. The key thing is a proposal is a persuasive document that starts with a good idea, but its intention is to persuade, but not with exhortation. It has to persuade with argument, evidence, reason. There's no substitute for a good idea. One of the great tragedies of being a program officer is seeing mm, almost good ideas really proposed with great care, and they just never get funded because they're not good enough. So the, you really want to work hard at the beginning to be certain it's a good, compelling idea that's worth the time it's going to take to carry it forward. And one may have to, to consider and discard a number of ideas before you get to the one that's really the keeper. Um, I'm going to emphasize this a couple different times. 
as you develop this idea, lay out what you intend to do, why it's important. Um, my colleague and friend, Daryl Chubin, uh, suggested this. I learned the uh, second item there 20 some years ago from a proposal he wrote. In place of the section titled Literature Review, he had a section titled What the Literature Provides. And there's a subtle difference, which is that when you ask the question of what the literature provides, what you're really asking is, what's the compelling argument for conducting research versus, well, why don't you just do some reading and answer the question? And what is available from the literature in terms of ideas and methods and findings to build upon in order to do the research, to step into the unknown that we're proposing to take with this proposal? So by that simple you know, twist of phrase that Daryl came up with in his proposal, he really makes much clearer what a literature review is intended to do. That's important because very often literature reviews are seen as castor oil. You know, we've got to have one, we've got to have a lot of references, and the best world will be lucky, and we'll cite all the panelists and reviewers, and they'll think we're, we're admirers. But really what you want to do is show where you're building and where you're venturing into the unknown, where you're doing something that's original and exciting, and what the compelling reason is for why we need to do research here, rather than just go to the library. You need to then convince people that this is the right idea, the right way, and you're the right people who've got the right stuff with you to do the work. And that's convincing with argument and evidence. Um, uh, contrasted to, I remember when our, my daughters were like five or six years old or something. Remember? You've probably got kids like that. I really want to go. No, Dad, I really, really want to go. Really, really, really. I and mean, that's exhortation. I mean, I, and you can say, keep adding really. So to say I really want to do this, it's really, really good. Really, really, really. Argument and evidence but persuasively. So how do you figure this out? You have to blend, you have to find the match between your idea and the right target, and those are the places to go, because the best idea sent to the wrong place isn't gonna do well. There is some flexibility within NSF to redirect stuff, so that we can take a proposal and review it in a couple of programs and see which one is the right one, or maybe both are the right ones, and we fund it between them. And that we can handle inside, you can suggest it, it may dawn on your program officer. Um, you'll see in a bit, I'm going to tell you that the project uh, summary, the one pager at the front, is really important because that's the uh, quick insight the program officer gets into deciding where this proposal should go in case it sits between places. All right, you've seen that. And in fact, this is outdated because there's now a new way to get yourself on the NSF web um, mailing list. OK, so you know that the Grant Proposal Guide is your guide through this. Um, it'll give you the mechanics, explain the things, including how stuff gets returned without review, which you want to avoid. Um, that goes without saying. Uh, collaborative proposals sometimes cause some confusion. There's two ways we do these. Uh, we can make an award to one institution that makes a sub-award to another. Or we can accept these as uh, what we call collaborating proposals. These are two proposals that are identical in proposal text with different PIs from different institutions and different budgets. Are they two proposals or one proposal? The answer is yes. Right? So effectively, they share a fate. They get awarded or declined together, but two awards are made, one to one PI at one institution for one budget, the other to the other PI at the other institution for the other budget. Neither is a sub-award. I prefer this mechanism. Some other parts of the foundation don't. What I like about it is that that way, if you are, the, if you are getting the sub-award, you are the NSF, I'm sorry, if you're getting the uh, collaborating award, you are the NSF PI on that award. So we have basically created two PIs rather than a single PI and a sub-award. So each of them can get all the honor and such due to an NSF PI, which matters to department chairs and deans and such. So I would recommend for things that come into my directorate, the collaborating approach rather than the sub-award. All right, so all the parts, I'm not going to go through every single part of the whole thing. This is in your handout, and you know this from others. But I will go through some of these parts and give you some advice. The project summary is critical. This is our, at a glance, understanding of what this proposal is about. It needs to address both the intellectual merit and the broader impacts of the proposal that you're writing. It must explicitly address both. A proposal is not a linear document. I'll, I'll say this again and again. You really need to bring people quickly up to speed with what this project is about 
which happens right here and happens in the first paragraph of the proposal. You can then backfill the rationale, the trajectory, the history, your experience, and so forth. But you need, first and foremost, to explain what this is a proposal to do, what it will do, why that's important. The heart of the proposal is what's called the project description. This is the 15 pages. Um, and we'll say a lot more about this. What's the research aiming to do? Why is that important? What does the literature provide and why do we need to take this step into the unknown, this relation to the present state of knowledge? That's where you would argue for the originality and indeed the transformative potential of what you're doing. Don't be shy, but be careful because it's going to be examined by experts. Um, the NSF review process, especially when we use a combination of email reviews and panel reviews, uh, places you really in double jeopardy. On the one hand, your proposal will be reviewed by the world's best experts. We're not limited to the United States. The world's best experts in the area, to the extent that we can induce them to write a review of your proposal. And to a group of generalists who may be more interested in the general trajectory of, of the field of chemistry or computer science, than the specific arguments that are at the cutting edge of your research area. So your proposal has to pass muster both with the people that live and die for your sub, sub, sub specialty and for the people who are thinking about the very big picture and the priorities for the field. It's a challenging review standard. So as you write, you have to really write with both audiences in mind. Um, results from prior NSF Support, if you've had a grant before, I think it's within the preceding five years, you have to explain what you did with it, what we got from it. Um, it's important. Um, I would hold off on the next proposal until you've delivered on the last one. So it's not a linear document. That's important because very often proposals like to begin with the history of the, f of the problem in the field. In the beginning, there was the atom, and it was good. Um, you know, what, what we're looking for is, in the very beginning, is what is this proposal about? What's the problem? What are you going to do about it? Why does that matter? Who cares? The more original, subtle, and complicated your ideas, the clearer, more careful, and more lucid your explanation must be. This would seem to be obvious, but too often we get proposals that say, well, this is just <clears throat> not helpful. Lay it out. You know, it can't be that this is so complicated and richly exciting that you can't tell us. <laughs> You've got to be able to tell us. Um, I don't know if I say this below or not, but the reviewer is never wrong. You have to remember that. A reviewer is not going to read a proposal that she can't make heads or tails of and say, I didn't understand the word, it's brilliant. <laughs> the reviewer is going to say, boink, go on. So bear that in mind. I mean, that's the way you'll treat it as a reviewer. Wait till you see some. That's just what you're going to do. Um, there's a great quote from E.M. Forster, the novelist. How do I know what I think until I see what I've written? So you've got a right to think. Don't expect to think it all out and then write 15 pages start to finish. You're going to have to think as you write, write as you think. Having done that, the only way to make this intelligible to anyone else is to rewrite it. You must rewrite for clarity and impact. And Hackett's dismal law of writing is that it's not finished till you're sick of it. <laughs> I have never written anything any good. Well, some people would say I should stop there. I've never written anything any good that I haven't written and rewritten and rewritten till I couldn't stand to look at it anymore. When it was new and exciting and great, it was underdone. There was extra in there, stuff missing. You know, I see a lot of heads nodding. Impre those of you who are going to write proposals, remember this. Those of you who advise people who write proposals, they're not to finish the draft at 4 o'clock the afternoon. You're going to push the button. The chances are it will not work, despite how it may look to the author. Um, simplify and streamline. Keep in mind what your main message is and get back to it. And get back to it in a consistent manner. If your proposal has three parts, it better have three parts everywhere. If it's got two and three and four, the reviewers are going to become frustrated, saying, I thought this was about two things, or I thought this was about three, or I thought this was going here, but it looks like it's going there. Or it started that way, but oh, wait, new idea. That's what happens if you think as you write and don't rewrite. Uh, sweat the small stuff. 
The details will matter. Clean it up. People become impatient with cluttered proposals, proposals with you know, proofreading errors and such in them. Robert Graves wrote a book, which I recommend on writing. Um, it's, it's, of the, it's sort of a more sophisticated, strunk and white elements of style. It's titled The Reader Over Your Shoulder. Uh, keep in mind the reader over your shoulder, the reviewer. You may not be an expert in your specific field, so you better explain yourself and why your specific little narrow set of problems have greater uh, importance. Make it very easy for people to like your proposal. Show that you're engaged and committed. The worst kind of interactions I've ever had with uh, potential um, PIs have been those where they've come up to me and sort of asked, well, what are you guys funding? I'll do anything as long as you pay for it. We want to hear what you're excited to do. Persuade us. We're actually open. We may look skeptical, but we're really suckers for enthusiasm, you know, principled enthusiasm. But we want to know what you want to do, what you think is exciting. So explain it in the proposal. Explain it to the program officer. If you lose a person early in the proposal, you've lost them forever. You've got to keep them moving down the same road as you early and often with a consistent structure. Figures and tables can help with that. Again, I've seen thousands of proposals. You cannot predict what reviewers will latch on to. Any loose thread anywhere can cause the proposal to unravel. So you've got to look carefully at it. You know, it's just, it's amazing. They'll find something in a footnote on page seven that will become the center of discussion for 10 minutes in a panel. And you thought you were putting a throwaway footnote in. Write defensively. Be reasonable. Young people tend to be too ambitious. Just remember that when you're advising them. So they should scale their activities down, usually. Uh, be honest and upfront. If there are issues, don't hide them and sweep them under the rug. We will notice. Better you say, well, you know, there's this issue. It could be handled this way or that way. I expect this problem. I will get through it these different approaches. I'm sure one of them will work for these reasons. If you have choices, say you're making a choice. Say why. Move on. Don't pretend there was no choice. Don't ignore the alternative. Because again, someone may be in the room and champion the alternative. Better to show you're aware of it, considered it, and took a different uh, tack. The bio sketch, everybody when they see this says, well, what if I don't have five publications of this or that sort? Put in what you've got. For young people, put in any evidence you can assemble that you are in good shape to do this project. You know, training, workshops you've participated in, summer schools, anything that will persuade reviewers that you've got the tools, the ideas to do your project. Reviewers and panelists love young scholars. They're still in a nurturing relationship with them. They are not your enemy. They will not try to undermine you. The older folks, they'll get after. But the younger ones who are just starting out get the benefit of the doubt. Take advantage of it. Give us the best arguments you can for supporting your work. Don't be daunted. Make a reasonable budget. We seldom, in a couple of instances I've, I've seen budgets raised, they're almost always moved the other way. If you ask for an outrageously uh, excessive amount of money, it could actually have substantive impact on your proposal. Typically, I tell panelists, ignore the budget. They start, they love to, to fiddle with budgets. I say, don't worry about the budget. Give me some advice about it. Are these ideas good? We'll figure out what they're worth spending, what's worth spending on them. That said, a budget that's outrageous will color your whole proposal. Don't include other stuff unless it's required. List all your current and pending support. If people think you're concealing something there, it won't stand well. You'll be surprised how small Washington is. NIH talks to NSF a lot, so just be explicit about it. Proposals fail, well, most often because they just don't seem interesting enough. It's an incremental step that the PI could have done without our funding um, or some Vagueness, errors, um, a casual presentation that doesn't show that they're really up with the field, you know, hurriedly put together. If you have to resubmit, stay calm, talk to the program officer. Don't be hasty. Think about the Ents in Lord of the Rings. Don't be hasty. <laughs> um, you could decide to turn it around and send it right back and wipe that blot of a decline off your record, but you might earn yourself a second decline. Be sure you've thought it through. NSF has a good institutional memory, particularly in the uh, standing programs. So we'll remember that you were close. We'll remember what the other reviews said of you. And we'll treat your proposal accordingly. In other words, 
that, that capital that you've built up with those three excellence won't be lost. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, bear in mind that when the program officer calls and says, uh, you know, I'm thinking of recommending you for an award, um, we have to talk about the budget, that you don't have an award yet. You're still negotiating, so be careful. I had one person call me up and say our program officer was meddling. He'd never been micromanaged by NSF before. It turns out that they were negotiating a budget. The guy wanted two summer months in his grant. The program officer said, you can have a summer month in a grad student. Oh, I've never been micromanaged like that before. Don't take the grant if you can't do the work on those terms. The program officer saw merit in the proposal only to the extent that it included some training opportunity for a graduate student. It was perfectly within the program officer's uh, authority to do. And remember, the guy was, it was an interesting conversation. We talked for about 20 minutes. He ranted and raved and said, now you, you are negotiating, you understand. And if you really, really can't do this project on those terms, then you know, he'll have to decline you. Okay, and that's where you can get help. Thanks for your patience in listening to this.